And, well, truthfully, I just got in because, well, I had a busier day than expected. Oh. Well, it, I, we did the Escape the Room. We did... Uh, oh, yeah, I saw you tweeting about that. Yeah. We did the Escape the Room. Then we went and had Vietnamese sandwiches. And then Ooh. we had... They were really, really good. Then we went and, and saw Jurassic World. And oh. I liked it. I you did? It, yeah. It's, it starts off really, really well because it invokes a lot of like old school Jurassic Park feels. And especially with the swelling music and the views of the island and stuff. And then it ends strong. Like it just ends really, really, really well with something totally awesome. So, but the middle is a kind of a mess, which is why it's not like Inside Out and Spy are strictly better because they're strong movies throughout. Like I said, Jurassic Park, or I'm sorry, Jurassic World flounders in the middle, so it gets kind of like, uh, okay, this is boring. And then it ends with something totally awesome. Yeah, I've seen terrible reviews for it, but everybody personally that I know that has seen it, but basically they say it's big dumb fun, it's a big dumb fun summer movie, go into it like that, you know, yes, and then absolutely. you've got the right philosophy. So, and you know what? Around here where it's going to be over 90 for the next week and a half, and that's one of the few places in town that has air conditioning, I, I think a lot of Seattle people might suddenly be going to see Jurassic World. I, so what is the deal with that? It's like just really hot there? Well, relatively. Uh, obviously, um, <laughs> obviously, there are places that are hotter. Uh, but most of the time in Seattle in the summer, you're talking the 80s is kind of normal. Uh, it's very rare that it gets into the 90s. It is super rare that it gets into the hundreds. And no, no one has air conditioning. Like, you know, some major buildings have air conditioning, uh, but no, most private houses don't have air conditioning because um, you don't need it because it's Seattle. But a couple of days ago, it's been 90 uh, at the, the height of the day. It's going to continue to be 90 every single day. And by 4th of July weekend, there's talking about how it's going to be well over 100, which is super odd. And no one is really prepped for it. It's, it's the, the opposite of, oh, God, we've got an inch of snow and we're not prepared for it. And people in Buffalo, like, laugh at you. Well, no, if you're not prepared for it, it doesn't matter. We know Seattle's not prepared for the heat, and it's just ridiculous. And what makes it worse, having grown up in Buffalo where it can get just as hot, but there's always a breeze, in Seattle, in the Seattle area, there's a lot of time in where there, it, the air is just dead. There's no movement. So there's not even a breeze to help. So what makes it even worse is it gets into the evening. Uh, like right now, the sun is finally about to go down. It's going to get dark, and it's it's hard to get cool air back into apartments and stuff because there's no breeze. So it's yeah. just miserable. But we're yeah. not here to talk about miserable Seattle weather. We are not. We're here to talk about Game of Thrones. Yay! Spoiler and cast. Spo we're, we're spoiling fucking everything. Like, it's going to be... Yeah, we're, we're, and we've got a lot to talk about. I actually yes. had notes for this Uh because I had originally planned to do more spoiler casts this season. But since we, I didn't, all my notes are getting thrown out. And so I'm just going to kind of talk about general stuff. And, uh, and it, it seems like every spoiler cast we've had for, for Game of Thrones this season has just been met with some sort of with some sort of disaster. We were supposed to have Jules on and really sorry, but she, she can't be on and we're bummed, but we're soldiering on. And I don't even know where to start. Well, let's, let's be clear about something. Um, we've both read the books, right? Like I'm, I've read the books. I think you said you are reading or have read the books. I, yeah, I read the books a while ago. Okay, so for those who have maybe read the books but not seen the show or, um, you know, at this point, we'll probably talk a little bit about both, but I think it's fair to say that the show has diverged in a couple of important parts well enough that even if uh, you've only read the books but not seen the show, um, there's going to be some spoilers, but some of it is just wonky. And I'd, I'd kind of like to start there, Mostly because I think 
uh, this is the first season that has seen giant significant changes from the book. I think in the end, characters end up where they need to be and plot lines end up where they need to be. And so kind of the end result is the same as the books. But how they get there in general, a lot of characters are completely different. Um, and I think we that might be the best way to go about it is just character by character. What do we want to talk about this well, season? Well, I think we can start off with a big difference. And it was something that that took show watchers by surprise, but not book watchers. But it's apparently now taken book watchers by surprise. And that's the death of Mance Raider. Yes. Th that's in the first episode of the new season. So it starts off, and, and very much like in the books, Mance Raider is asked to kneel before Stannis, and he refuses. And so the red woman is like, well, let's burn him. For his she just blood. wants to burn everybody. She just wants to burn everyone and more on the burning in just a bit. <laughs> but that happens. And then you have a guy called the Lord of Bones, who is also one of the wildlings who is with Mance Raider. And so he's training with the, with the Night's Watch and he's being pretty brutal. And he's just kind of an asshole. But then you come around and you find that Mance Raider is actually the Lord of Bones. And actually, we did talk about this because we did have one spoiler cast after, I think, the first two episodes. So we, we did go over this. But from what our, our conjecture was at that point was that Mance Raider is actually dead. Unlike in the books, and, and I guess I have to finish my point. You find out that Melisandre had put a glamour on the Lord of Bones to make him look like Mance Raider and then make Mance Raider look like the Lord of Bones. So Mance Raider has been alive all this time. And it is Mance Raider who goes out to Winterfell to try and rescue Jane Poole from marrying Ramsay. And ultimately he gets captured along with the shield maidens he brought, and, or spear maidens or whatever. And then that's when... Theon and Jane Poole escape from Winterfell by jumping off a wall. And, and if more you on don't, that in a second. Yeah. And if you don't know who Jane Poole is, uh, that's because you've only watched the TV show. And that's one of the other giant differences is it's not Sansa that goes to uh, Mary Ramsey. It's um, Jane Poole who is pretending to be Arya Stark. Right. And so they're passing, basically, Baelish and his compatriots in King's Landing are passing off Jane Poole, who is one of the few survivors of the Stark Massacre in King's Landing, as Arya Stark. And they've convinced her, hey, this is what you, do to, you need to do to survive. Just pretend to be Arya, marry Ramsay, and you'll be good. Well, like the show... It doesn't really work out for Jane, and she is constantly abused by, by Ramsay, and Theon, in his redemption arc, ends up shedding his Reek persona, regaining himself as Theon Greyjoy, and escaping with Jane Poole. So but yeah, so once again, this is, this is, the end result is kind of the same. Uh, it's just, a, in this case, a character has taken you know i was joking with friends of mine that one of the reasons i like this show the season so much is because i am finally at the point in where i can enjoy the show the same way everybody else is who hasn't read the books because they've taken enough liberties that i don't know what's going to happen next and sansa is one of them when she went off to go marry ramsey while she follows the storyline of of aria quote unquote of jane Poole. Right. Uh, it's still, it's, it's Sansa, and it's, you don't know what's going to happen. And I thought, I, I thought that made a lot of sense. The, I think season five has been all about streamlining some of the storylines that happen in the book, because around this time in the books, a lot more characters are thrown at you, a lot more stuff is happening, people are, you're, the, the number of characters is turning over really fast. And so the TV show, I think, is doing an excellent job of keeping the story essentially the same, even if it has to change characters to eliminate characters. And Jane Poole was one of them. Right. And now you have, 
and and we'll we'll skip we'll skip around a bunch because like I said, my to. notes my notes are very harebrained at this point. <laughs> but uh one of the things you have to remember is that they did that like you were saying, it's the season of what characters can we combine and what characters we got can get rid of. And another casualty is John Connington and the supposed Aegean uh, Targaryen, or, or I, I think that was the name. It was Old and Young Griff yeah. as they were introduced. A- and so for those who haven't read the books... And the, the dwarf that's with them, the lady uh, dwarf. The, uh, Polly, I think is yes. her name. Anyway, so, so for those following along at home, Tyr- this is branching off from Tyrion's storyline. So what happens is Tyrion escapes from King's Landing and ends up in Pentos, very much like he did on the show. The difference is that Varys sets him up with, with uh, I think his name is Elio Maripas or something like that, the merchant guy that you met in season one. And Elio is the one who is taking Tyrion around and hanging out with him at his manse, watching him drink. And then Elio sets him up. I know I'm butchering his name and I don't even care. That's so, okay. uh, Elio sets him up on a ship called the Shy Maid with a dude named Old Griff, a younger guy, kid named Young Griff, a Septa named, I can't remember her name, but he, and she has child. Uh, she, it's, there, it's very obvious that she's had a child. She's a little bit older. And so Tyrion takes to calling her the Soiled Septa. And it's, it's, it's a little band, and they go around and are ostensibly going to Marine to meet up with, uh, with, with, uh, with Daenerys Targaryen. You find out, though, that this young Griff, or this old Griff, is actually an old Hand of the King who escaped King's Landing. He was the Hand of the King before John Aaron. And... This kid is supposedly Rhaegar Targaryen's uh, son, the rightful king, uh, Aegean, who was supposedly a baby who the mountain killed uh, during the sack of King's Landing. So that's the claim. But you, and there, there is a voyage, and then all of a sudden Jor Mormont shows up, kidnaps Tyrion, and they end up in the fighting pits, and... Uh, Tyrion is then thrust out of Marine and rejoins like a bunch of uh, a bunch of cell swords who are getting ready to attack Marine. And his what he's working on is he's trying to get these cell swords to to turn their cloak and fight for Daenerys. None of that's happening now. No, no, no. they cut out most of that. And 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 once again with the with the limited scope of the series, uh, with it only being ten episodes, I. I kind of get it because unless I, I would like to think and I continue to believe that because Martin is involved in the production, even though it's, it's been pulled back a little bit because he's been writing so much, that the end result that the TV show is going to get to is the same place that the show is going to get to or that the, the books are going to get to and that uh, writing out these characters is just tightening up story for the TV show and that what you'll get with the books will be a much more comprehensive, much richer, much deeper experience, but is not going to be, you're not going to miss anything in the TV show. So um, that journey that we miss with, with Tyrion and, and Mormont, um, I don't mind because once again, what, the end result is the same. They both end up in the fighting pits. They both end up um, at Marine, they both end up working uh, for, well, <laughs> kind of working for Daenerys. A little and bit, yeah. Th- shit happens and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's characterization that you kind of miss. And also, um, uh, uh, I've just lost his name. The, the bald eunuch. Ah. Uh, Varys. Varys. Also, Varys ends up there, which he needed to. He needed to, to be there. Um, so the end result is the same. We're just, we're missing stuff. And, you know, hopefully that will also encourage people to watch the, or to read the books to get a more, you know, well-rounded sense of what the hell is going on. Yeah. And it's going to, 
it, it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. And we're we're going full book spoilers and everything, so that's yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you're prepared for this. But in the books, at the end of that whole thing, you find out that Varys is actually in the Seven Kingdoms, and he kind of murders both uh, Maester... What's his name? I, that I don't the, know. The Grand Maester. Pycelle, Pycelle. Oh, Pycelle, yes. Yes, so he murders Pycelle, and then he murders Keevan Lannister, who is taken over as regent. And he makes it look like the Tyrells did it to sow discontent. And because basically he feels that a Targaryen needs to be on the throne. But in the books, he's not working for Daenerys directly. He's working for trying to get this Aegean on, on the throne. Yeah. And now with that eliminated, I think it, you can safely say that in the books – this Aegean Targaryen is not an actual Targaryen. He is a he is a fake. Or he, in the end, doesn't matter. It's it's very possible that he he ends up not mattering or gets killed or something. Um, but yeah, I I who knows who knows what's going to happen. It is also possible that my assumption is totally wrong and the books are going to go in a completely different direction than the tv show but the fact that the tv show whenever it diverges can, comes back i like um i'm trying to think well we we should go back and close out um the bolton um funness with um <laughs> well, with the Red Woman and the burning and all that fun stuff, there's been memes all over the place, especially Father's Day. Oh, oh my God, God, that was awful. So, and, and apparently this is going to happen in the books at some point. Uh, George, George R. R. Martin did say that this was something that he intended to do eventually. I hope you didn't have your sits on the Iron Throne chips on Shireen Baratheon as I did. <laughs> Because, well, rest in peace, Shireen Baratheon. You know what? what the fuck? No one should be surprised. From the first moment that we meet the Baratheons, um, what is the first thing he is doing? He is burning shit on the beach. And he is uh, sacrificing to the Red Woman. And every time he talks... I actually I was listening to... Um, uh, I don't remember the podcast, but they were talking about how, especially in the in the show, he comes, he is portraying himself as a tragic hero, as the rightful heir to the throne, who is reluctantly having to do whatever he needs to do in order to fulfill his destiny. And he has time and again shown that when it comes down to what do I need to do to advance myself towards the throne versus anything else? Advancing towards the throne is his primary responsibility. And it it's too little too late for him and the mother to uh, feel anything for Shireen but embarrassment, contempt, and the use of her. So as horrific as that was... And as it's, tough as that was, to, that was one of the worst things I've ever watched on TV. And they didn't even show it. No. And you know what? What surprised the hell out of me, so earlier in the season, we get Sansa marrying uh, Ramsay, going into his bedroom, and having sex with him. And granted, that first sex scene, it is obvious she is not happy. She is not having fun. She doesn't want to be there. And later, you can, you can say for sure that she's being abused and raped because she is uh, locked away and, and it is obvious she's being abused and raped. But that first sex scene, after they are married, it's uncomfortable because of uh, Reek being there and right. Ramsey, we know Ramsey to be an asshole. But the public outcry of, I'm never watching the show again because the rape, because of the rape. First off, how have you watched the show this long? Uh, that's what I said. Like, And second, that's not the rape you should... First off, it's technically not rape. She was consensual. And I don't want to victim blame because it's obviously she's not having fun. But at no point does she say no. 
At no point does she resist. At no point does she try to not. Later on, absolutely, it, it is horrific, and she is trying to get out of there. But that first sex scene, the, the public, uh, this is the worst thing ever, and how could Game of Thrones go there? Um, and they yet, already did. They, they did already did. Like the second or third episode with Daenerys' marriage to Khal Drogo. Yeah. The that scene was a... plays out almost exactly the same yep. way. Yep. She's not happy. She is not having fun, but she is will she has agreed to be there and she is not saying no. And then those two characters go off in a different direction because they're essentially good people. So he's it's not that there was abuse there, it was just you know, for it was all the a right very reasons. Very rough start. It was a very rough start. He's not neither of them are used to anything, blah blah blah. The, but you're absolutely right. The same thing happens with Sansa and, and Ramsay. We, as viewers, know what an asshole he is and know the shit that he's gotten up to and so projected that this has to be rape because of what's happened. Um, anyway, that happens. And whether or not you agree with me that it is rape or not, even if, if you say it's rape, okay, and certainly it turns into that later on, the argument that... Uh, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. I don't understand. And then the lack of public outcry over the sacrificial burning alive of a small child. I'm an adorable child. Okay, I'm not saying that if you're an <laughs> ugly, terrible child, like that you're Jaden Smith, then you, they deserve to get burned. I'm not saying that at all, but they really, they, they pulled a Wheaton on us. They got yeah. us like so on Shireen's side. They even had the scene where, where Stannis and, and Shireen made a connection. He's yep. like, I wasn't going to send you with the damn stone men. You're Princess Shireen Baratheon. Oh, but if you didn't know the scene before that when, when Stannis sends uh, the Onion Knight away, I mean, as soon as he sends the Onion Knight away and there's that moment that they have where here's the stag and I'm saying goodbye, I'm like, fuck. They are going to go there. They're going to... Because, I mean, that is just telegraphed. And yeah. it's, it's, it's beautifully done on purpose because if you catch all those little things and you have that sense of dread and then the, the marching her to the, to the sacrificial altar, because that's what it is, is slow and deliberate and you have to listen to her and you have to listen to the flames and see them and then you have to watch the parents as they realize, oh shit, what have we done? And it is long and it is painful and it is horrific for all of the right reasons and it's it shouldn't be a surprise because this is what stannis has done all along he has sacrificed whatever all the people around him everyone around him and he he does it like it's the the, the tragic oh god i have lost this and that and the other thing so it's the surprise for him isn't that he's burned his daughter alive the surprise isn't that his wife has committed suicide. The surprise is that, for once, it doesn't work. No, he gets beaten. And, and it, it plays out much quicker than in the books. In the books, the battle hasn't even happened. It's just they have... Well, in the books, you don't even see the battle. The battle it's just Jon well, Snow gets a letter from Ramsay right. saying, basically gloating that he's killed Stannis and he's slaughtered the battlefield. Right. Uh, so you don't even see the battle and you're, you're you left to assume... Know, yeah. But you also don't know if Ramsay is lying or not. True. Because the battle at, at that point, I don't remember if it had happened or not. I think, I think it does happen, but it's, it's quote-unquote off-screen. The way you know, because uh, Melisandre does show back up at the um, at the the yes. wall. Yeah, she does show up there, um, and that's shown. Um, well, I don't think she left. I don't think she went with the army. I thought that no. In the books, she stays because of crap. reasons. Yeah, and because well, in the in the books also, um, the the mother and the the daughter stay. They're all there. Aren't right. They? I think yeah. so, because that's Melisandre's first POV chapter. Yes. Yeah. Which was well, all and, kinds of interesting. So anyway, following her for a second, so we end up with her back in the place she needs to be. 
because uh so Jon Snow ends up exactly he basically follows the book plot line to a T. He goes out and tries to save the wildlings. He half fails. He comes back. He sends and and once again the show telegraphs this beautifully when he sends Sam and Gilly off and they are his last obvious friends in in at Castle Black. It's like okay, you're going to die. You know, one of you or both of you are going to die. And his betrayal is totally understandable, uh, horrific, but understandable. Um, Both the book and the TV show leave him almost positively dead. They don't actually, like you, there's a ton of blood in the show. And in the books, I believe his chapter ends with him just falling unconscious, but he has been stabbed multiple times and left to die. And the... The assumption is the reason that Melisandre is back at Castle Black is to do what we've only seen once from another red priest, which is bring someone back from the dead. Yeah. And they apparently, and I, and I haven't looked into this myself, but apparently the showrunners did confirm that Jon Snow is dead. Oh, but, did they? Okay. Yes. But that doesn't mean that he can't come back. Because Although there was all those, sh- those pictures of him having cut his hair. They'll go this way. This is an assumption about, well, how could they save Jon Snow? Well, Melisandre could bring him back. If, if they've confirmed he's dead, which, yes, she can... At least other red priests have been confirmed to bring people back from dead. Um, and the actor has cut his hair, which we've been told... What, what's that? Oh, it, it, something beeping outside. I don't know. Ignore it. Ignore it. Okay. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, I think Castle Black is in, a, in an interesting place no matter what. Either he's dead and you've got a bunch of assholes now running the show who have no love for the wildlings. They really only have allegiance to Jon Snow. So when and if shit hits the fan at the wall, uh, if Jon Snow isn't there, the wildlings, I don't think are going to come. I don't think they're going to come to any of those people. Um, if he comes back, can you imagine if she finds him, brings him back to life, and the next morning they expect to show up, you know, and quote unquote find the body, and instead there's Jon Snow at breakfast? Yeah, it, it would be. They, there would be a, a lot of fear. What the fuck? And we can't kill him, so we might as well do what he says. What would hope? Hopefully. Yeah. Do we know, I, I don't remember this in the books, in the show, the last time we saw Ghost was when he came to help Sam uh, during I, the fight. That was in the show, yes. So we haven't seen Ghost. So it's possible that, that Jon Snow worked into Ghost. Now, we haven't seen Jon Snow do that. And I think mm-hmm. in the books... There had been hints that he had warged into ghosts before, but I we I don't think we've seen that specifically in the show at all. Not in the show. The only one who's done warging has been uh, Bran and his companion, and we haven't seen them all season. Um, even in the book, from what I remember, I don't think it was full on warging as much as like seeing uh, through ghost eyes and stuff uh, like that. Like, oh god, that was a very vivid dream and a very mm-hmm. deep connection. But also in the book, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. ghosts. Uh, goes up to Melisandre and and lets her pet him, doesn't she? Like, I they have it's a connection. Been a while. Like I, I think so. So it's, I mean, I have this out of craziness theory that the first episode in Castle Black that we're going to see next season may be Ghost bringing Melisandre to John's side, if you know, yeah. because if if that is a connection that is important then we, we might see that happen. Um, also, her bringing him back to life may be a double-edged sword because if she's so hot on burning people with royal blood and the rumors that have been swirling about who Jon Snow's mother is true, she, as soon as she finds out who he might be, she may burn him alive. Who knows? Yeah. And the rumor we are we are referring to, and it is something that was addressed directly in the show, is L R plus L equals J, and that is the theory that that uh, 
Rhaegar Targaryen did not kidnap and rape Lyanna Stark. They ran away together and had, and had a, a child baby. named, eventually named Jon Snow. Now, the, I would have said that especially given the fact that Jon Snow is definitely dead, revivable maybe, but definitely dead, at least for now, that that theory is crap. However, they addressed it not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. They brought it up, I think, early on in the season when, they talk, when Baelish was talking about Lyanna Stark and how beautiful she was and kind of that story. But yep. then there was someone, who was it? It was another character talking. Was it talking. the old maester? Was, it was the they, old maester, that, yeah. that's right. And the old Castle Black Maester, I, right. whose name escapes me. Uh, uh, Aegean Targaryen. Well, yes. Because he was Egg. No, yes. he wasn't Egg. He was calling out to Egg. He was calling out to Egg. Uh, Aemon, Aemon Targaryen, that's who he is. Aemon Targaryen, that, that's, that's him. So I think that theory is, is still alive. And I, I, be, basically because they brought it up so recently. And there was no reason to. There was no reason for any of those scenes, especially when Sansa is kind of filling in the party line and going, oh, yes, it was all well and good until Rhaegar Targaryen kidnapped and raped her. And there's mm -hmm. a smile on Baelish's face like, oh, you don't know the story, but I'm not going to tell you. So yeah. I, well, I, I think, think that you can't kill Jon Snow and still have that thread dangling. No, but in the show, at least, um, he is the last person. He doesn't know, obviously, but he is the last person who could discover the truth. And so in the show, if he dies, then whether or not whoever his p real parentage is dies with him. If he is somehow brought back to life or, you know, in whatever means or somehow survives, un then we can find out. Or maybe there is another character that is yet to be uh, introduced, but... Do you think yeah. the Reeds know? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Because Howland Reed was at the Tower of Joy with Ned Stark. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because that, once again, none of that is really talked about except outside of the books. We get the very vague uh, story... Um, or at least, you know, bits and pieces of the story in the show. I don't know. Well, I no, think... the, Howlin' Reed was definitely at the Tower of Joy. No, it's... I know, but, like, what, uh, whether they know or not is hard to tell even from what we know from the books. Well, it's and we know even less. to tell because they've not mentioned it. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think whether they bring back Jon Snow in any way, shape, or form is going to inform that rumor. Uh, at least in the show. Uh, if he remains dead, then I think it's, it is safe to say, no, he is not that child. Or at the very least, maybe he was that child, but at this point it doesn't matter anymore because right. he'd be dead. Um, and it would not be outside the purview of this show to have that, that again, that tragic hero, that hero that was almost in the pla right place at the right time, but then things went sideways. Well, you know, the other thing that's been missing the last couple of seasons has been Lady Stoneheart. And if they wanted to replace that character in a way, then bringing, and, and for those of you who don't know, from the books, Lady Stoneheart is the adopted name of uh, Catelyn Stark after she has been brought back from the dead. So By a red she, priest. Yes. By she, Thuros of Mir. So she gets killed at the Red Wedding by having her throat slit. She is brought back by that red priest um, and is mute because her, her vocal cords have been slit um, and takes on the moniker Lady Stoneheart and in the books seems to have some... Some some powers, some otherworldly powers. She seems to be some kind of agent of of chaos and powerfulness, and is doing shit all over the place. And if the show wanted to replace that character in a way, I mean, I had said, wouldn't it be funny if if Melisandre brought him back to life and he just showed up at breakfast the next morning? But 
bring him back to life and now he takes on that um that role you know he has spent this entire season Jon Snow being tempted by his former life before taking the black being tempted by uh going after the Boltons being tempted by the Baratheons being tempted by everybody of here is your chance to get what you have always secretly wanted or not so secretly wanted to be um to be a uh a Stark and take on the role of the of the 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 person who basically brings justice to everything that's happened to the Starks. Um him being brought back to life by Melisandre, if he was to take on the powers that Lady Stoneheart has in the books, he might feel, well, I am now free. I my bond to uh the Castle Black only is until my death. I have died. I've been brought back. I'm free of that. It is time for me to go back to what I really want to do. Time to kick some ass. Exactly. You know, time to go get the revenge that I have always deserved, that, that my father deserves, that my brothers deserve. You know, as far as he knows, everyone is dead. Not a single person in his family has survived. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it could be interesting to go that way, too, if he takes on that role. Ooh. Ooh. And we haven't talked about Arya, and I want to talk about her, because I spent last season, uh, the third season, waiting as much as the buddy cop Arya mountain show was fu- or hound show was fun, I spent all season waiting for her to get to Bravos to work for the Faceless Man, and to finally see that is awesome. And I, yeah. that kind of followed the books pretty closely. Well, it, it diverged in a couple of places. She wasn't cat of the canals as long. Yes. She went blind at a different point. I was actually talking about that over dinner with, uh, with some people that I was hanging out with. Yes. Because in the books, she pretty much goes blind at the beginning of her training. And it's, yeah. it's consensual. She drinks the thing and then she wakes up blind. She and, doesn't quite know what's going to happen, but she is told that it, this is the next part of your training and accepts it. It is not... You know, so yeah, but the, it's, it's the not same punishment of- for for doing what she did to Mar- to Marin Trent. Yes, Trent. Tr- uh, sure. I wish we had Jules here. She would have had everything like that ready. Names, yeah. names, all the but names. Anyways, and and the thing is, ar- around the last season when she killed the tickler or Polliver or whoever it was with needle by sticking them in the throat. That mirrors a scene in, in the Mercy chapter that was released from The Winds of Winter, where she does that to, I think, to Marin Trent, or to someone who's traveling in, in Bravos, mm. to, with, along with the Master of Coin. So it's pretty much the same thing. Master of Coin comes to Bravos to visit the Iron Bank, and he's got a couple of King's Guard. One of the King's Guard is someone that's on Arya's list. So it's sort of the same thing that they have now, except way more violent and oh, yeah. a little bit more fucked up. But then, but since she never killed the, the, the skinny man, which she did do in the books, then that's, there's a punishment. There's some sort of like reckoning to be had. And that's when she goes blind. Yeah. But it's... It's been interesting to see that world realized and yeah. those characters. And I'm, I'm, I'm super, I was super excited to finally see that because when it got to the end of last season, she was the character I was the most excited about as far as where her character was going. Um, and so now finally having seen that and not really knowing what's going to happen with her, like I am, we've talked about this before. I don't know if it was on or off air, but I am totally excited to be at the point where I don't know about 99% of what's going to happen next. I have a, a vague idea of a couple of characters based on what's happened in the books, but most of these characters are at a point in where I, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And being able to talk about that freely without worrying about accidental spoilers or worrying, you know, like when I was watching these episodes with Mary and Chris for the longest time, I couldn't even join in discussions post episode because they knew I had read the books. And I didn't even want to enjoy participating in the discussion in case, even if I said something off the cuff that was a total I wonder, 
that they would assume because I'd read the books that maybe I was insinuating something. So I spent a lot of time over the last couple of seasons nodding my head and talking about how cool something was, but not being able to participate in how cool would it be or I wonder what. And I'm at that point now. And I think the discussion we had was, this is why I will not continue to read the books. Because as awesome as the books are, and as much as I've enjoyed the books, I have enjoyed this season specifically participating in the discussion more. And I want to continue that experience. And once the show is over, I will go back and finish reading the books if they're out. Right. Ugh. And I am... Uh... I will continue to read the books. Fair enough. Because I feel like I'm already invested. And I think I'm going to get a different experience from what's happened in the books versus what's happening on the show. But we should move on and talk about some other differences, one of which being Dorn. Oh, and... yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. We haven't even talked about what we happened haven't with We haven't talked Jamie about Dorn. And... So, first of all, in the books, there is a shift to Dorn. You had never seen Dorn in the books until... A Feast for Crows. And in the books, just as in the show, uh, Marcella Lannister is, or I'm sorry, Marcella Baratheon <laughs> yeah. is, is in Dorn hanging out. And one of the people she's hanging out with is a lady named Ariane Martell. And Ariane Martell has some grand plans. She is going to declare that since Joffrey's death, Marcella is the rightful claimant to the Iron Throne based on Dornish law. And she is going to put her on the throne. So there's this plot. Things go awry. Uh, Marcella's ear gets cut off. And that happens. And you find out that, that uh, Dorn Martell has been playing this game where he is tr has a lot of pieces in motion, and one of which is one of his sons is going out to... Uh, to Marine to go and try to marry Daenerys Targaryen. There's also, he's sending the Sand Snakes everywhere after they get arrested, but a lot of stuff is going on. He has a plan. And oh, yeah. Ariane had accused him of just sitting there and not doing anything, letting his brother and his daughter and everyone he loves die and not doing a damn thing about it. But then you find out, no, he's been doing a lot of shit about it. He's just not told everyone because he's playing a long con. And we get none of that in the show. No. <laughs> the but show in fairness, in the... is exactly what Ariana was accusing him of in the books. Sitting there, doing nothing, letting everything happen around him. It's, it's possible he has been doing some of this and we just haven't found out yet. But because of, I'd like to believe because of the lack of time that we get with these characters. Because uh, in the books... The, the Sand Snakes are their own chapter. They're, they, they get their own personality. You get to, to see about it. They are sympathetic characters um, that you get to learn about. And in the book, in the, the show, they are relegated to the, uh, the wrathful instrument of destruction of, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Ela Elena Sand or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's obvious in the, while in the show, she accuses um, Bashir of sitting there and doing nothing. He does talk about, no, you know, I've seen war. I know what it does. I am taking the path that will bring us to peace. I am, you know, he's allowing Marcella to, to, to marry the, the prince. He is encouraging, you know, and then... I think you get a sense of his long con in that last conversation when he brings Jamie on in and basically brokers this deal because he, by all rights, could have just slaughtered everybody. Could have just slaughtered Jamie and Braun, could have done whatever he wanted to uh, Marcella. Um, he could have gone complete Cersei on them. But what he does is kind of brilliant in the, I'm, I'm going to kind of give Jamie what he wants. I'm going to, um, I'm going to send him home with his niece. I'm going to send wink. her. <laughs> wink, wink. 
<laughs> air quotes, I'm going to send her with the, the guy that she loves, and then I'm going to basically turn him into, well, you know, the, the guy who Oberyn was supposed to have the seat on the council, he's not there anymore, and so it makes sense for this kid to take over, which makes com also complete sense. It gets one of his family back on the small council of, at King's Landing, which is a powerful position to be in, which he cannot be at. Uh, which is one of the reasons he sent Oberyn there to begin with. Um, it subverts the intent of the Sand Snakes, which is basically just wanton slaughter and all-out war, whereas war just gets everybody dead. This, if it had worked out, um, gets him and everybody there more power and more prestige. And he is playing the Game of Thrones... Uh, in a way, in the right way, because what he's doing, what we've seen, especially in the show, is that those who play the game with force end up getting met with force and dying. But those who are smart, those who are subtle and guileful and are uh, playing the long con, like Littlefinger, like, you know, like all like these Varys, other... Yeah. Like Varys, like uh, uh, a tyrant, in a way. Um, those people win. You know, and Cersei, when she is... When she is being manipulative and she is being smart, she is winning. It's only in those moments with her, and we'll get to her in a second, uh, where she is being forceful, where she is, I will kill you, I will throw the might of the Lannisters at you, that she fails. So, you know, whether this is an ongoing thing or not, he's, at least in the show, the, 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 um, this, the <laughs> Bashir, is playing the right way with the game. Now, the interesting thing will be when uh, Marcella is we're assuming she dies. I'm assuming that she dies as well. I'm assuming she dies. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the Dornish prince, who's the kid's name, I don't remember. Tristan. What he, Tristan. It'll be interesting to see what he does. I would like to think, considering the circumstances, considering the way, the reason Jamie was brought there, considering the obviousness of the hatred of the sand, sand snakes and their use of poison, and that he would be at least intelligent enough to recognize that she's been poisoned, that he will not immediately, because the easy out is, oh, he blames Jamie for this girl's death and hatred and war. But if he is smarter than that, and he doesn't really need to be brilliant. He just needs to be um, okay. He just he needs, just to, needs to be a little smarter than the average bear. Exactly. Then he will very quickly realize what exactly has gone on, and his reaction to that is going to be very telling and interesting because um, he could demand to turn the boat around and go back and extract vengeance. He could... Uh, continue to King's Landing and take over Oberon's position and be deceitful and guile and be like, well, if this was an attempt to hurt this truce and this trust between these two, you know, and to, to kill the peace that my father is going for, then I'm going to do the thing that's going to hurt them the most. I'm going to continue on with the plan, which is for me to go and have a seat on the small council and not take action against you know a big war so i think what he does next season is going to be vital to what happens at king's landing yeah Ugh. and yeah and then there's cersei answer and then me there's this. cersei okay answer me this i seem to remember and this is, seems like a, a small thing i seem to remember from the books that they shaved her bald when she did the walk of shame they did yes okay so the that is a small change but I was actually super surprised when they just cut her hair, when they gave her what is almost kind of a, a cute crop. I know in this world, her having short hair is shameful, but I was actually very surprised they didn't go for full bald. I thought they would. Be, and I also thought that they would, um, that it would be Lena Headley nude and not a, not a body double that was digitally made to to do that. I figured that. Oh, was it? Was it a body? I did not know that. Yes, it was a body double. It was a very sophisticated 
means by which they did the body double. Like it was, there was CG and there was like face so mapping. Does, yeah, it I was, was going to say it had to be sophisticated because it fooled me. I didn't know. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it it fooled a lot of people, and the only reason why people knew the difference is because well, we've seen uh, Lena Headley naked. We saw her naked in Three Hundred. Well, and not just that, between 300 and her role in the Judge Dredd movie, while it wasn't, she, I don't think she was naked in that at all. Uh, she was bald in that. So no, she was, no, she, she had a very similar haircut to this. Oh, it was, okay. I, but I thought between those two roles, that was at least circumstantial evidence that she would be okay with the bald. The dude and the the nude and the bald, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder... Well, you know what? It, in the end, it doesn't really matter whether it was the actress or not. Um, in my case, they fooled me. I thought it was her, so good on you. And it doesn't... In the end, it doesn't really matter if it really was the actress or not. The important thing is the character. I thought it was interesting they didn't go full bald. I wonder why. I wonder what that. I wonder if that's purely cosmetic that Lena Headley let her head be cut that way, but wouldn't go bald, and they wouldn't put a bald cap on her for the next, however long she's going to be bald next season. Although I could see Cersei um, immediately putting on a wig, being like, "Bring me the wig master," and then that's it. She's wearing a wig until she's got tresses again. I don't know. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And I think the old, the big change that they did with Cersei's storyline was were the motivations for the Faith Militant. And yeah. in the show, it's strictly I am going to get at the Tyrells and I'm going yeah. to use Faith to to do that. But if you'll recall, and they really didn't focus on this in the show too much. But in the book, there was this definite theme of incompetence on Cersei's part. Even though she thought she was this great leader like her father, she actually wasn't. And yeah. she really wasn't fooling anyone. One of the mistakes she makes is that is in settling the crown's debt. And one of the big debtor or uh, creditors that the crown has is the church. So as a conciliation to the church, and probably a means by which to kind of loose those hounds on the Tyrells, that's why she agrees to do the faith militant again, to rearm them. However, they completely don't do that in the book. It's all about the Tyrells. Yeah. Well, I mean, they start off with their own motivations, and then it, to go back to your, you know, yes, she does a series of mistakes. Her mistake is egging them on and giving them power in the name of the king uh, and then alienating a lot, assuming that Tommen is going to have the power to protect her when he, she has done nothing but coddle and shelter him away from this um, and then getting herself into a position where, yeah, he's going to march up and try to get his mother back but not be willing to do what she wants him to do, which is slaughter people. Um you know, when she arrives back at the at the keep, um, yeah, she's got a couple of her her retinue there, um, but a lot of those people weren't going too far out of their way to rescue her because they knew they knew what was going on, they knew what position she had put herself in, they knew you know they they knew how that would get bad, and the only person who really could do anything was Tommen, and Tommen is a nice boy and wasn't willing to slaughter church people even for his mother or even for his wife. Right. And it'll be interesting to see how they resolve the stuff with, with Marjorie, Marjorie and the church. Because, yeah. if, because in the books, you did never got the impression that Marjorie was even power hungry. She was just kind of there. And I, I do agree that, that show Marjorie is a lot more interesting because of the way she's trying to play the game. But at the same time, it's – since there's that gray area uh, – well, it's, not, it's actually not a gray area. She's definitely playing the game in, in the show, and she is manipulative in the show and, and trying to get her way. And, and, and that's actually another big difference is that the way she manipulates Toman. In the books, she manipulates Toman by getting him kittens because Toman is still a little kid. Yep. And – in she, the show, 
she's using her her little princess. Well, in the show, Tommen is a little older, and she, she is, is a lot older. And and yeah, and I think I almost think that's a little bit more interesting because be, since it's not just little cutesy gifts and stuff, it's real power. It's yeah. the power of sex over a nascent teenager. It's and also that, the the power of two adults, no matter how young or how much younger and how much older they are, adult in this world. And gives him, you know, instead of being a child king, he is a technical adult king. Um, and I think what might be interesting with Marjorie, because the way she has played the game, um, as you said, it's she's being manipulative and she's using guile, but she is also, she's killing with kindness. What's the, one of the first things that she did when she arrived at King's Landing and was going to be beth- uh, betrothed to uh, Joffrey? She immediately started ingratiating herself to the people. She went out of her way to visit orphanages. She uh, was pulling Joffrey out to go wave at the people. She, she is beloved by these people and, and has gone to great lengths to make it that way, to be the the woman who is not just, oh, here's the pretty wife, but has, you know, provided for the the poor and the hungry and the destitute and everything. And so I think if, if she had a little more information, I think it could be very interesting for her to take the same walk of shame because I think her outcome might be very different because Cersei uh, got what she deserved from the people um, and had a horrible time. But I could completely see Marjorie taking that same exact walk and people treating her like Jesus. People um, offering her kind words. People laying down carpet at her feet. People helping her when she stumbles. Um, People encouraging her because of the way that she has portrayed herself has treated people and has been portrayed as treating the common folk. Um, And this whole thing could backfire on Cersei if her whole plan is disgrace the Tyrells and make it so they have to leave without it being this war. um, The whole thing could backfire if Marjorie decides to take that walk and and the people respond the way that I, I think they would. Did they name Sir Robert Strong in the in the show? I can't remember if they did or not. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm gonna say I don't think they did. I think they just said this is your newest member of the King's Guard, and oh look, it's this dude who's gigantic and 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 who's taken a vow of silence taken a vow of silence and gosh have we seen a guy this size before yeah maybe it's even played by the same actor which is really cool but uh, yeah 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 well considering how many people have played the mountain <laughs> well he's now played the mountain the longest this is true he continues to play the mountain in all of the mountains incarnations yeah oh god that moment when she decides to let him loose upon her quote unquote enemies, that's gonna be a bloodbath. That's gonna be that's just gonna be insane. Ugh. It could be interesting when uh that could be the moment when Jamie returns with the dead body of their last uh one of their last children. I mean yeah. Tommen's the only one that's left, right? In the show, yes. And as we know from the prophecies of Maggie the Frog, which we did see at the beginning of the season, uh, yeah. There, that, Tommen's that, not going to end well Tommen's either. Tommen's not long for the world. And I'm wondering if it's going to be one of these situations where it's analysis paralysis, where we've seen him get into these, like, not be able to make a decision, and that's what gets him killed. Maybe. I could also see that part of the prophecy not being as straightforward and that he doesn't actually die. But that whole prophecy is about a a younger, prettier woman taking power away from Cersei, who at this point we're assuming, and she is assuming, is Marjorie. Um, If that was to come true, if the the moment happens in where Marjorie, where Tommen sides with Marjorie and expels, excludes, turns his back on Cersei... 
I could see her going Jewish mother and saying, you are dead to me. I well, could see her having that moment and you are not, you are no longer my son. It metaphorically. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that, 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 uh, Maggie's prophecy allows for that because she says gold will be their crowns and gold will be their shrouds. Yeah. That's, that's the prophecy. So it's like, as much as I would love Toman to pull through and, and be that guy, I don't see it happening. I think he, he, is, a, he is a dead little Lannister. That also uh, assumes that the prophecy comes true. And uh, as we've seen, prophecies don't always come true. I mean, how often did Melisandre say the prophecy is that, the, that you are going to be the, the Baratheon's going to be the king? And well, he's dead. You know, none of her prophecies came true time and time again. So just prophecy in this world apparently is uh, as malleable as people are. So it'll be interesting to see. But I, as, a, as someone intimately familiar with the way uh, the, the Jewish culture works when you say you're dead to me and mean it, um, while that's a stretch, I, I agree. I could totally see that being metaphorically the way this works out. You are no longer my son. Goodbye. But we'll see. Maybe, maybe that's just me talking. Oh, God, is there anything? I mean, we haven't really talked about Daenerys and the dragons. There's well, so much to fucking talk about. Okay, well, I, I, one thing I did want to mention about the, the Marine storyline, and I think that's probably where we're going to leave it after this. But yeah. uh, there was a big fan theory that Hazar Lorik was the leader of the Sons of the Harpy. And apparently that's not the case because stabbing your leader in the chest is a really odd way to treat that person. Unless he was their leader until he agreed to marry Daenerys and then they turned their back on him. Unless they, they were, he was their leader until he was seen as a turncoat for now uh, siding with the, the, the usurper. Well, I think in the books it's very different from how it happens in the... In, yes. in the show, because in the show, she's almost like compelling him to marry her, whereas in, in the books, it's more of a deal. Like, he's this slick kind of salesman. He's like, hey, if you marry me, I promise, uh, like, what was it, like, a hundred days of peace or something. Yeah. And it's, everyone was like, that's really weird that he could promise that and not have any control over it. As well, during the fighting pit uh, scene in the books, he is constantly trying to get Daenerys to eat these crickets. And he's like, hey, so there are these roasted crickets that I have. Why don't you have some? And Daenerys is like, no, I'm kind of distracted. He's like, no, I really think you should have some crickets. And strong Belwas, who we don't see in the, in the show, comes nope. over. He's like, oh, well, if you're not going to eat these crickets, I will. And then he becomes deathly ill. Yep. So the situation, I think, is very different. And, and again, it's, it's a unblurring of the lines. I, I think it's what they've done is they've made sure that you, you are under no illusions that Hazor Lorik is a member of the Son of the Harpies. Yeah. He's not in the show. And, and he's just some schmuck who, who he happens to be a lord and he and Daenerys is like, I'm going to marry you because it's tradition. And then, oops, you're dead. Sorry. Well, Sorry it, about that. It is a little more than that in the books or in the, in the show. He does come across as being one of the few um, marine um, uh, higher, higher ups, uh, non-slaves who continue to basically... Uh, beseech Daenerys for stuff on behalf of the old ways uh, unapologetically like you know yes this is the new way and no I'm not advocating a return to slavery but there's a reason that the fighting pit should be there there's a reason for this there's a reason for that um, he at least in the show is portrayed as one of the few rich folk uh, especially the one that's on her small council that tries to speak his version of, of truth to power, which Daenerys has always respected, uh, not always agreed with, and sometimes harshly disagreed with, but 
has never been the kind of person or ruler who kills someone because they are a naysayer or say no or disagree with her. Uh, she's always interested in hearing that. And um, that scene with all of the, the former masters being fed to the dragon, uh, being fed to the dra her dragons, I think shows that. Uh, all of the other masters are kind of portrayed in that moment as bumbling and afraid and cowardly and fat and slovenly and all of the things that you kind of assume about uh, a slave owner, he, while still terrified, still comes across as like, all right, this is the wrong thing to do and you shouldn't do this, but you know what? If I'm going to die, I'm going to face it with my eyes open. Um... So I think having her pick him makes sense because if if that lineup that we saw in the Dragon's Lair was her choices, then she clearly picked well. Right. But yeah, I... Okay, and then that last scene, I do have one criticism. Uh, her... A lot of the CGI in this, in this show is fantastic. And the dragons have been consistently fantastic. And... Uh, that moment where she gets on the black dragon is fantastic. And then her flying away is the worst green screen I've ever seen. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I, it was and, horrible. And I really wanted to like that scene because it was a very majestic scene. That, that profile of her lifting up over Marine and then, and then lifting off was pretty cool. But yeah, yeah everything up to that was pretty bad. Uh, as an aside to a spoiler cast we're going to do uh, here soon for Orange is the New Black, I did not think I had seen a worse green screen until I saw the, the green screen that they used in the cars in Orange is the New Black because that one is really bad. Like, and it's laughably bad. And it's extra surprising because the the especially the dragon CGI had been so good, had been so excellent. And the the scene after that, when they land and she's interacting with him um, on the ground, is also excellent. The CGI in that is fantastic. It's just her flying and the background is just like oh will you just take down the green screen already come on so come i don't on, know what don't, was going don't on that, with that shit with the helicopter or something i don't know just, yeah. just anything or cgi her i mean now that you've said that uh the cersei body double was all cgi'd then obviously they know what they're doing with body double cgi then just because the the distance stuff that they did the shots of um, those on the ground watching her fly up ahead and it's her on the dragon together, those shots look great. So obviously they can do the CGI well, but oh God. But anyway, that, I do agree that technical limitations aside, that's a majestic moment. That's an important moment because that's her reconnecting with her dragons when all season she has been disconnected from them for a variety of reasons. And also it gets her metaphorically and physically back to the beginning of the story surrounded by Dothraki, which could be interesting. Right. And they, again, that's another spot where she is in exactly the same place in the show as in the books. Yes. We do not know. I, I think she recognized the Kalisar. So it's someone that she had previously, like, had an association with through Drogo. Maybe. But we, yeah. don't, we don't know anything more than that. I think they definitely recognize her. I think the, the that moment where she suddenly takes off the ring and drops it, I don't think that's her trying to hide her identity. I think that's her leaving a trail. I, be, I, I totally agree, yeah. Because I, I think they recognize her. I think they probably saw her flying overhead on the dragon and followed them. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's... Uh, Kalisar's a huge, but yeah, I, I don't know that it was a chance meeting. No. Uh, well, or at least it's a chance meeting, but it was not a, hey, we're just riding along and all of, all of a sudden we find a white woman. I, I do think they saw Drogo, or they saw... Um, Drogon. Drogon, there we go. And followed Chick on Dragon for a little while. 
Is there anything else we want to go over before we end this? We've been already going for like an hour and a half. Yeah, I mean, this this is what happens when you wait until the end of the season to do a spoiler <laughs> cast. So we'll but definitely. In a way, this is so good. Well, we'll we'll be better about it next year. We will definitely. Uh, regardless of which personnel is available, bring you something a little bit easier to digest. And I, I, I apologize for, for the lack of material on this show because it's a show that I love. And I, that is, it, even in its streamlined state, this show is worth talking about because yes. it is still rich, it is still good. And, uh, and obviously... A lot of people have opinions and and need to need to have those opinions addressed, and in some cases need to be told why their opinions are wrong. <laughs> so, real quick before we end, as a final uh, ending bit, who's your money on next season and why? Okay, so I'm going to have a couple of categories. Uh, most likely to be revived from the dead has <laughs> to go to Jon Snow. Um, most likely to kill a Stark is gonna go to. Hmm, that's that's a that's a good one. There's so few Starks left. I'm gonna say most likely. Actually, there's still quite a few Starks left. It's just everyone thinks all of them are dead. Right. I'm gonna say most likely to kill a Stark is going to be the Snow and Sansa. <laughs> the, mm. the snows of Winterfell and San as the killer, and then Sansa as the killie, but we'll see. Uh, most likely to to survive the season, I think is going to go to Sam because I I think now that he's going to be our POV guy in Old Town, there's no getting rid of him for a while. And finally, uh, I'm reviving I'm I'm revising my most likely to sit on the Iron Throne. By saying, at the end of the show and the books, there will be no Iron Throne. Mm. Okay. It's a cop bad answer. Anyways. No, 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 no. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, you could take that a couple different ways. Um, I think I, my money from the beginning has, as far as the overall uh, person to walk away uh, in charge is still on Dana uh, is still on Danny is still on Daenerys. I believe that she has the right combination of practicality and compassion to uh, to actually succeed. I think she continues to be uh, smart and ruthless, but still human. And though, and and doing it in all the right ways so far, and where even when she makes a mistake, she is it's not such a, a dire mistake, and and that she can't return from it. Um, so I think between her power and her compassion and her smarts, and continuing to surround herself with smart people whose uh, counsel she values, even if she doesn't listen, I think she's still my pick for if there is still an iron throne to take it um i think we're gonna see the triumphant return of bran i think of all of the prophecy shit that's been running around between the red woman and cersei's background and uh the weirwood the old gods and the new gods and the this gods and the that gods and all these other gods and and there, there was the comet and everything that's been going on i think Bran has shown that he is going to get to the heart of what's going on in the North. Um, and I think what I'd like to see is her, him becoming the new warden of the North in spiritually. He is, he becomes the, you know, whatever it is he in that tree. He becomes the actual North. Like, yes. Bran becomes the North. This is the Song of Ice and Fire, and I think people have been assuming that Jon Snow is the uh, epitome of the ice part of that, but it's been easy to forget about Bran being out there becoming some spiritual being in the north of, of goodness. Um, 
I think he is going to return as the ice and Danny is going to bring the fire and between the two of them, they might be able to defeat the White Walkers and whatever is going on with those guys. Oh my God. Okay. We have to talk about Hard Home because we are Hard, hard Home because we, that was a battle that we did not see in the books, but saw very vividly in the show. And I think one of the coolest things was the confirmation of something that people had thought of Valyrian steel for a very long time. Yes. That it was an effective weapon against a White Walker. And lo and behold, Longclaw has claimed its first White Walker. Yep. And, and if that is... Um, I think what's more important about the Valyrian steel is how do you make Valyrian steel? Dragonfire. You need dragons. You need to have a dragon lineage. And who is bringing dragons back but Daenerys? So I, I do think... I see that Bran and Daenerys the teaming up, even if they don't know it, to bring this down. And then my wild card goes to Arya. Uh, depending on how long uh, timeline-wise this series takes, she has also been incredibly successful in, BA, in doing whatever it takes to survive. I think she's lost some of her humanity just because of the brutal way that she is willing to just kill whoever is in her way. But she's not necessarily completely compassionless. Um, I think her becoming a faceless man, woman, person, her becoming no one is the culmination of a, a long trip on her part. And I think what she goes out to do to bring justice and to, to, and to make the faceless uh, God happy is going to be incredibly fascinating. And I see her being a wild card in all of this. I see her becoming a powerful agent of chaos and I look forward to it. So my, my money is on two Starks and a, a Targaryen in this. I think everybody else, I would like to see Tyrion stay by uh, Daenerys' side and continue to do what he does best, which is be the brains behind the brawn. But I, could, I, I don't necessarily see him surviving. Um, I see everybody else playing their parts, but I think the three of them, Arya, Bran, and, and Daenerys, are going to be the, the... Whatever the final outcome is, I think they're going to be standing at the end of the ruins of the world. And on that note, uh, please join us on Tuesday when we are going to, we're, we've got a couple of good treats for you. We are going to have one of our friends stopping by and uh, talking some Orange is the New Black with us. Uh, her name is, <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, her name is Jackie. She is Jackie on the site. Yay! And... She's going to be talking some Orange of the New Black. We're not going to broadcast that. That'll be released on the spoiler cast. And then we are also going to have her on the show proper. So we're really looking forward to that. That's Tuesday, uh, June 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Glibshark.com, please join us. Uh, you can follow us at Glibshark. You can follow uh, her at Oba Crazy, him at Road underscore Block, and Sir Not Appearing in this podcast, Jack Edithil <laughs> at jack edithel but for all of us here at glip shark we're really happy you could join us at this late at night and uh we look forward to seeing you soon bye